What's happening in Antioch? That's what we're going to talk about today in Acts 11. Wow, we are making good progress in church history, and we're finding out what happens after Jesus ascends back into heaven. We saw Peter take leadership, really being bold, and now we're going to see how the church continues to grow. I think that all these things that Jesus said, all these ways that Jesus gave parables, new wine and old wineskin, he put new wine in new wineskin, all of that is going to start gelling with people. And so they're going to be like, oh, that's what he meant. So that's where we're going to continue off. And so it says that now the apostles and the brothers, the disciples, people following, who were throughout Judea, heard that the Gentiles have also received the word of God. We saw that the last time. So Peter went up to Jerusalem and, well, yeah, I guess it would be up. It is high up as compared to the coastal lands, which is flat down. The circumcision party criticized him for hanging out and eating with uncircumcised men. There's a circumcision party? So that's ESV. In NIV, it says something, the circumcised believers. Because again, people are thinking in old ways. They got into this track where only the Jews are going to be saved. That God only cares for the Jews. Like I said, there's two ways you can look at it. That God chose the Jewish people to be his representatives on earth. But does that mean that they are the only ones who are saved? Or you can look at it as that God chose the Jewish people to be saved and that was it. And that's the way they heard it. You know, like I said, if you get a little off in the Bible, just a smidge here and there, and then all of a sudden you wake up 3,000 years later and it's quite different than what it actually said. And I think that's what's happening here. And we are bringing it back to what it originally meant. So with this criticism, Peter explained to them, you know, I was in Joppa. I saw this vision of this sheet and there was all these unclean animals. And God said to me, don't make anything unclean that I have made clean or common. He says that this happened three times and it was all drawn back. It all went back to heaven. And then at that very moment, so he's recapping the whole thing, which I just recapped last week. And so he tells the whole story and the Holy Spirit, you know, fell on them just like it was all of us. It reminds me when Jesus said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if God gave him the same gift he gave us, who's to say they're not? Who's going to stand in God's way? Boy, good point, Peter. The Gentiles have also been given the gift of repentance. Let me just quote it in ESV. Then. To the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Good job, Peter. And looking back, you know, like I said, at my own Jewish faith and the things that I was raised with and the way I looked at it now that I'm a Christian and all the things I learned when I was in Israel, as people spread and as people go throughout the world, they're all God's creation. Every single one of them is God's creation, right? Just like he was like, I'm going to first come back for the Jews, chosen people, then I'm coming back for everybody else. How is that not heard? And maybe when it was heard, it was misinterpreted. But then again, some of these people are disciples. They never met Jesus or they never followed him around like the apostles did who heard everything. And like I said, I think Peter in particular, but the other ones must be getting the opinion, oh, I got you now. I see what you mean. And so now Peter is making sense of his vision in terms of all the things that Jesus said, and it's starting to gel with him. He's got it right. This is exactly what it is. Salvation is not just for Jewish people. It is for everybody, right? Everybody. So now we go on to the Church of Antioch. I want to talk about Paul. And it says that those were scattered in persecution because of what happened to Stephen traveled far. They went to Phoenicia and Cyprus is going to be up along the northern coast of Israel. And then Cyprus is an island, I think. And then so Cyprus, Antioch, we've heard people in Ethiopia. I mean, we know this word is traveling. Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean between Turkey and Greece. Then Antioch is going to be the third largest capital in the Roman Empire. 
there's Rome, there's Alexandria, and then there's Antioch. And that goes about, someone says that it's about 300 miles from Jerusalem. And it would be a good place if you're trying to get out of the hands of the temple. It's a good distance, right? No one's going to come looking for you there. So it's a good place to go hiding, right? And it says that hands of the Lord was on them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Yay. So this church is growing there too. This is, I think, the first church we've heard of that is outside of Jewish territory, outside of Israel. And this church is going to be important for almost all of the Christian history. This is going to be a very important church. And it said that there were people from Cyprus and Cyrene who were coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. Now, I've seen it both ways in a lot of commentaries where people will say the Hellenists are Greeks or they're Greek-speaking Jews. So I think that it may be sort of a blended term that if you, oh, I don't know, you said something like the Spanish. Well, are those people who speak Spanish or are those people who are of Spanish descent? You know, the term gets confusing, right? And so in this case, we don't, I'm not really entirely sure, but he spoke to Greek speakers and they may be Jewish, they may not be Jewish and talked about Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a lot of people turned to the Lord. And so this report, it says, came to the Church of Jerusalem. Maybe not even a building, but us as a core group of people, we are the church. I don't think a church is a building. I think a church is a people. So they sent Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Now, if you were someone as like one of the apostles, and you say, well, you know, Peter, Peter's great. You know, Peter's like a leadership man. He knows everything. But boy, I could use encouragement. I'm going to go for Barnabas. So when he came and he saw what God's grace had done and told him, you all should remain steadfast, it says. And he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith and more people were even added to the Lord. So Barnabas went all the way to Tarsus to look for Saul. And he found him and brought him to Antioch too. And for one whole year, they met with the church and taught people. And for the first time in Antioch, the disciples were called Christians. And I think the, the words Christians technically meant like followers of a yeah, thing. So like if you were in the school of Socrates, you would be a Socratean. You know, that, that, that doesn't make sense. But I think that's the right term. I just think that the word does not flow off the lips. But anyway, it just means follower of Christ. That makes sense. And so now man, it, it took a whole year from the Calvary Bible study I was listening to about this chapter. They were saying that it is one thing to be an apologist or to be someone who goes out and speaks and introduces people to Jesus. But the thing you have to do is you have to follow it right up at, with teaching, with education, with telling people what the, everything is about. You can't just leave bring new converts and say, OK, good luck. Right. You always have to do that. Every good pastor knows that. And so even when I became a Christian, what was my first step? I got to find out more about this. I have to know everything. I have to know what it is I'm supposed to be doing, not doing, saying, not saying. You know, I, I felt that that was the next thing. And so that's what they did. They, Paul and Barnabas went there and taught them. So good job, Paul and Barnabas. I think the other nice thing just in that whole passage was the fact that Barnabas thinks, I'm going to go get Saul. You know, sometimes I think it would have been easy to just banish Saul to Tarsus and say, well, he can go up there and just do his thing. Because one, we don't trust him. Two, he's really into this. So he'll do a good job. We don't have to worry about it. But Barnabas, the, the man of encouragement, brings Saul in, decides to include him and, you know, maybe train him a little bit, explain to him. I'm sure Saul had a billion questions that he would love to ask an actual apostle. So in these days, then prophets, it says, came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And so that one made me want to get into what is a prophet? This gets confusing, right? What is a prophet? So, so far we've seen different roles. You know, we have apostles. We have disciples. We've seen teaching. We are now hearing about prophets. And so what is a prophet exactly? And so when I looked it up and tried to kind of tease this out, 
there's two separate things that prophets did in the Old Testament. It was kind of an Old Testament thing. One, they gave a special message from the Holy Spirit. They were given a message by God and told, give these people a message. And so this is where we see David being confronted with his sin. It wasn't a future forecast. It was right now, you're messing up. Sometimes it had to do with future events. And so that's where we get into the word prophecy, where we're looking into the future, but not every prophet did the future. So it could be one or other, but the idea is that this is a special gift, a special ability associated with the Holy Spirit. So one of these prophets was named Agabus, and Agabus and another of their prophets that were there, and they came and talked to the people, and they told them there's going to be a big famine all over the world. And this, it says in parentheses, took place in the reign of Claudius. Claudius um, was a very famous Roman emperor too. They were given a prophecy of the future, and so they were trying to help before anything happened. And it said they sent it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And that ends Acts 11. Wow, really, really interesting stuff. To talk a little bit more about this famine is there was a famine that happened between 41 AD and 54 AD. And famine struck in this area. I mean, we've seen famines happen and been talked about in the Bible before. We talked about Joseph, right? Joseph predicted a massive famine. And Josephus even re- wrote about a particularly bad famine in 46 AD. Could have been the one. It might not have been, but, you know, that's a big amount of time, 13 years. So, but it seems to fit. But this famine, was consequential, right? And so you could see one church helping another church. What I'm going to meditate on this week is something little that kind of stood out to me, where it said that Barnabas was good, was a good man. I thought, gosh, isn't that amazing when the Bible calls you a good man? I'm going to meditate on this week as a person. What kind of things could a person like me do to be considered a, a good woman, right? I'm not going to be in the Bible. But you know what I mean? I want to be that quality of person. And what I'm going to pray about this week is that we have that generosity. When we hear about one church struggling, having a famine, we, we hear all the time now. Our messages go out and we hear when churches get hit with hurricanes. You know, my church, I remember them telling us that one of our churches did get hit with a hurricane and we sent people, we sent stuff and money, we sent it to Katrina people. That is my prayer, that we always have that generosity to help our brothers and sisters and the people around our churches, not just our brothers and sisters, during times of woe. And what I'm going to share with others is this fact that Peter stands on the ground that this message is for everyone, Jew, Gentile, and who are we to stand in God's way when someone is granted repentance that will lead to life? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And just so you know, my friend M has a blog at msgarden.com. That's E-M-S garden.com. She has beautiful flowers, backyard, and gorgeous stuff. And she's a believer. She's the person who talked to me about Jesus. But her love of God's creation is just outstanding. And you can see her flowers and her articles right there. Thanks so much for listening.